2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse number 20. Thank you for coming and being with us today. I see some new faces and welcome y'all to Oak Grove. Hopefully y'all like it and come back. If you like country folks, you ride it home. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself, somebody say purge yourself. Purge yourself. From these he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. Well, we don't hear that word much no more, do we? We're going to hear it today, if God Amen. help us. Sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. That word meet means a requirement. How many knows that if you're going to be used by God in special ways, there's requirements that you have to meet? Amen. Now, I don't understand all the Old Testament because God used a lot, of, a lot of stuff back in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there are some requirements to be met, to be used by God. But nevertheless, we're going to go ahead. That's what that word meant, and meet for the master's use. How many would like to be ready to be used by the master? Amen? <laughs> Verse number 22, he's talking to a young man here. Timothy's a young pastor, young leader of a church. Paul's trying to get this man ready to be equipped for the ministry, and he's letting him know, don't bring no junk in my house. Make sure it's holy. Make sure it's clean. Verse number 22, flee also youthful lust. Yeah, young folks got lust, old folks don't deal with no more, or don't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Got quiet, didn't it? Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I want to stop right there. Father, I thank you for your word, God, that is infallible, it's without error, Lord, is able to do exceedingly abundantly, is quick, powerful, and sharper than any to it is sore piercing even to the dividing of a son of our soul and spirit and the joints of merit is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Lord, the word of God knows us better than we know ourselves. Lord, we thank you for that. That not only that it's like the law, the law had the same power to show us. It was like a mirror. Show us how dirty and how sinful we are. But the grace, Lord, that you came with the new covenant, give us power to clean us up. Doesn't leave us in the mirror looking dirty and ugly. Lord, you, you left us, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says you made everything beautiful in this time. And Lord, today we pray for the anointing of the Holy One of Israel, Lord, to rest upon this minister, Lord, as I try my best to preach the word. Without you, I can do nothing. All things are possible through you. And I'm asking you to show up, have your way in this service today. Be glorified. Let the church be edified. And if there's any loss under the sound of my voice, they'll be saved. The church will be encouraged as we leave here to go out and win more to you, Lord. And I pray the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak. My heart may be filled with love, and I'll give you all praise for in Jesus' name. I ask these things. Somebody shout amen today. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise for his word for you today. I felt embedded in my spirit to preach upon this word sanctification. Now, I know that's an unpopular uh, uh, subject to be preaching from, and I, I, I'm already convinced that I may not get a lot of claps this morning. It's liable to get quiet. But I feel like that we need to be sanctified. I feel like if the Bible talks about sanctification and we're a full gospel preacher, I don't feel like we should pass pages that we don't think is going to pump the crowd up. I think we ought to preach what the Bible says and let the Lord deal with the folks. Amen. Amen. But now when you go to talking about that word sanctification, there's a lot of principles to be taught in the word of God. Number one, we think that sanctification is purification, but it's not. Let me tell you something. If you're sanctified today, you're sanctified because God sanctified you. Amen? Now, I know there's a process, and we're going to talk about it today. That's the reason I got you to requote that scripture with me when he says purge himself. Now, there are some things that we're going to have to do to be sanctified, but the most important thing we need to know today that we cannot be sanctified unless Jesus Christ gives us the power to be sanctified. Our righteousness is filthy rags, but God said, Behold, uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God cometh to take away our sin. He that's in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm telling you today, you may be filthy in your spirit, but if you come to God, you can go to God filthy and come out clean. He's got power over all the enemy. He gives it to us. Praise God. I'm thankful for sanctification. I believe we need, now, let, me, let me tell you what sanctification means before we get into it. The word actually means set apart for the use of God. Amen. That's all it means. Set apart 
for the use of God. When you get saved, you need to make your mind up. We're living in a world that's wishy-washy. Double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We got people that come to church. They think about getting saved. They're like King Agrippa. They're almost persuaded to be a Christian. And they keep coming to church. Nothing wrong with keep coming to church. But you need to make your mind up that I want to be saved. I want to be used by God. I want to serve in the ministry. The same streets that I come out of. I want to lead people out of them. Because greater is he now that is in me than he that was in this world. I didn't have power on my own, but now that Christ is in me, he's the hope of glory. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It is a blessing to be sanctified. It is a blessing to be set aside. Wherefore, come out from among the world. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. Sanctification was something that I longed for for years. But I didn't know what I was longing for. The old song said I searched for him, but I knew not what I searched for. I longed for him, but I knew not what I longed for. You know, we all want to be clean, but a lot of folks don't like taking baths. Come on. I, I don't know how you feel, but some folks don't like to wash clothes. They'll tell you that if you didn't get real dirty, just take them off and hang them back up. If I wore a pair of britches, I don't care how long I wear them, they're going into dirty clothes because they dirty. I'm only going to have the men folks to help me. They're all the women folks who's going to keep silent in the church. <laughs> women folks say, if you come in here and wash these clothes up, you think twice about throwing them into dirty clothes. <laughs> you all the we didn't. That's just like Christian folks. How many knows that every day that you go out into the world, if you get dirty, you need to come home and get cleaned up. Praise God. That's what's wrong with a lot of the church world nowadays. We can't get the lost folks to come to church because we're no different than the lost. Come on. Come on. They say, if that's all you got, I can get what you got right here at home. Uh -oh. But when they see a difference in us, how many knows that when Jesus Christ sanctifies us, he changes us. Praise God. He pulls us out from our old habits, out from our old ways. It's a crying shame that you go and tell everybody, I got saved. I got baptized. I'm, I'm going to church now. It's, it's, it's going good with me. And they still hear you talk that filthy language when you get angry. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's all right. We all see it every day. Come on. This is what's being taught, but it's not biblical. They have no scripture to back them up. Quit preaching doctrine that you don't got no word to stand on. If you want to tell somebody something, take them to the word and show them the word. Some people say, why you got all kind of different denomination people come down here? I tell you why, because I preach the word. I don't preach my doctrines. I don't preach my denomination. I don't preach my fundamental truths only. I preach God's truth and God's word. And if you'll preach the Bible, he said we won't have nothing fall back on. Amen. We got to worry about the gainsayers and the people that try to find fault in you. Keep finding fault. There's no fault in my God. And if my God be in me, it's going to clean me up as well. See, that's, that's what the world can't comprehend. We, we contradict ourselves when we say we got Christ and Christ is perfect and Christ is holy and Christ was without blemish and all of a sudden Christ lives in us but we don't live like Christ. They can't comprehend that. We say one thing and do another. Great. How many knows that, that, that everybody's not easy to love? Amen. Some people are hard to love. Amen. How many knows there's different types of love? Amen. Absolutely. I love my son. I love my daughter, but I don't love them like I love my wife. Amen. It's a different type of love. I didn't say I love her more. I said it's a different type of love. It's a rope. I don't love no other woman like I love my wife. And my wife ought to say amen right there. She ought to say praise the Lord right there. I better not be. If I know what's right and I know what's good for me, then folks don't frighten me and go crazy. Amen. Glory be to God. There's different types of love. There's a father's love that he has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Amen. And there's also an enemy love. Wow. How many knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. That enemy love. I love you from a distance. <laughs> I love you, but I don't want to go down the same aisle at Walmart with you. Come on, <laughs> Come on somebody. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good unto them that hate you. And pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew chapter 5, I think it's verse 44, somewhere on that. 
But God says that if you want the world to see me in you, then you've got to start showing the world me. Amen. There's nothing worse than having a gift and never show it. I mean, Christian people can get so humble sometimes that, that we are pridefully humble. I mean, God blesses us with a gift and God teaches us to use the gifts that God gives us not to bring glory to ourselves, to, but to bring glory to God. And then we're so bashful and so so shy sometimes. They say, oh no, didn't let somebody else do it. And God says, no, if I'm giving you a gift, and how many know the greatest gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is love, charity, amen? He says you can prophesy and talk in tongues and, and, and cast out devil. You can do all of that, but if you have not charity, which means love, then it profits you nothing. Everything you do should be in love. Somebody give God praise for putting love in your heart, not only for your husband, not only for your wife. That's natural affection. And by the way, because of Iniquity abound, the love of many shall wax cold in the last days. Perilous time will come. Men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient unto parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 teaches us that in the last time that mothers won't even love their babies, and fathers won't even love their babies. And we're seeing that distortion being lived in America nowadays for a man to walk out on his child and say I don't want nothing to do with him. Can I tell you that's just a prophecy from the word of God that said these things will happen but you don't need to be taught natural affection. Natural affection comes naturally. But enemy affection is something you got to work on. Loving somebody who's cursing you that takes a lot of prayer. That takes a lot of discipline. We got that discipline. We tell people that we got that discipline until somebody cusses us out. Somebody talks sharp to us. Somebody treats us bad. And the first thing we do is want to retaliate. We want to revile back. We want to snout back. But the Bible says rendering no man evil for evil contrary wise blessing. Come on, son. Bless them that curse you. Pray for those that spy. Oh, no, 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 no. I ain't talking about talk about them that despitefully use you. I'm talking about praying for them that despitefully use you. How many is the last time we prayed for one of our enemies? That's what's called sanctification. Yes. Jesus said they'll know you by the way you love one another. Amen. He says doesn't even the enemies bless them that bless them? You haven't done some great thing just because you're friends with a sinner. Just because the sinner that, that respects you and goes to church and talks highly of you and you're friendly with them, you've not done anything. Let me tell you when you've done something. When they stab you in the back and talk about you on the phone and run your name down. I ain't going back around them. Why ain't you going back around them? They hurt my feelings. Mm. We don't want to get on feelings. We're talking about sanctification. That's the part. Come on, bro. But too many people wear their feelings on their shirt sleeve. And they can't bring God glory because it hurt their feelings. But Paul's telling Timothy, you're going to have to get over your feelings. And you're going to have to learn to separate yourself. He says, purge yourself from these type of things that come to you. Because he said, look here. I know the church house is filling up. I know people's coming. But in a big house, there's all types of vessels. Yeah. There's all types of people. On Sunday mornings, there's all types of people. On Sunday nights, it's the same way as all types of people. And just because we go to the house of God don't mean that we're children of God. Satan comes to church every single Sunday, believe it or not. I don't know what church he shows up at, but I know there's many demons that are on his force. And they go around trying to do everything they can to steal, kill, and destroy what God is blessing. But I come standing on the word of God today that upon this rock will he build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Sanctified will cause you not to have many friends. The word setting apart. If you got a lot of friends and your phone's filled with friends, now I got a phone full of contacts. I got a phone full of acquaintances, acquaintances. But if you've got a lot of friends, you might want to check your status and see what you're doing. Because if you stand for God, everybody's not going to like you. Amen. 
If you stand for God, many folk not going to like you. I remember one of the discouraging and depressing things about me getting saved. You know, you hear the old story of glory be to God. When I was at the altars, I just felt the burden rolled off and all the sins gone away and the chains that I couldn't broke, he broke them. And all that's true. When God saved me, he began to take things out of my life. I couldn't take my own self. But I remember some of the depressedest moments of my life. My phone that used to ring all the time on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. I'm like, hey dog, where you at? You gonna come hang out with me? It quit ringing. People didn't want to talk to me no more. People didn't want to associate me no more. So that's a Jesus freak. Leave him alone. He's gone down that church. He's gotten drunk off of that new wine. And he can't get drunk with us no more. But I come to find out I lost quantity of friends. But I found quality and friends. I found a friend that's speaking closer than a brother. And they may not like me, but that's all right. Just because you don't like me don't mean I can't be what God's called me to be. I found out I didn't have to have people to have my back long as God be for me. Who can I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now? If God be for me, who can be against me? Folks is going crazy right now because it's the election season. Yeah. Flipping out. Wow. Waving at you, talking you ain't never talked to you before in your life. Right. <laughs> Doing stupid stuff to try to get in an office. Amen. <coughs> if God's meant for you to get in that office, you'll get there. Right. But if you have to stoop down to man's level just to get there, you don't need to be there. Right. Amen? Amen? I tell you what we need. We need some God-called people in this country. We need some God-fearing people in this country that don't go what man wants to go by, but goes what God wants to go by. But the thing about it is, as soon as we get one in the office, they want to get him out. Because this world is full of evil. That's why they got to talk about politics and make everybody mad. But that's not my fan. It don't matter who your fan is. It matters who they line up with the word of God. Some people will vote for people they could care less what they stood for. You better find out what people are standing for just before you go and cast your vote. Amen. How can you vote for somebody who believes in slaughtering babies? Break, Come on. I know it's quiet, but I'm preaching the word of God this morning. How can you vote for somebody that believes in putting homosexuals on our front line to fight our battles? Hogwash. It's time for the church to rally and say, hey, it's a sin if you don't vote. I believe it's a sin sometimes to vote. Sanctified. I can recall back when the children of Israel had to have them somebody in there. Bless the Lord. They'd always had a king. They'd always had a leader. And they wanted them somebody in there. So they picked Mr. No, no, no. God gave them Saul. That's what it was. God gave them Saul. And, and, and God told Samuel to go down there and tell him, says, why do they have to have a king? What's wrong with me? I'll be their king. No, that wasn't good enough. Boy, I tell you, the world's in trouble when God's not good enough. Right, brother. Right. And he said, he said, I tell, he said, I tell you what, if they want a king so bad and they want to vote somebody in, I give them somebody. They don't have to vote. I, I give them who they want. They wanted Saul because Saul was big. Saul was strong. Saul looked like the one for the job. But how many knows God don't judge the outward appearance? He looks upon a man's heart. Just because he's wide in the shoulders don't mean he can fight the good fight of faith. Out. God chooses the weak things to confirm the mighty. God chooses the simple things to confirm the wise. Come on, somebody. When God chooses a preacher, he don't look at somebody that can talk clever. He finds him somebody that don't think they're good enough to do the job. So when they get to the pulpit, they won't lean on their own charisma. They'll lean on the Lord and say, Lord, if it be not for you that's on my side, there ain't no way I can preach the word of God. And so, and so I must move on. And so he, he chooses the king. Saul gets in there and Saul does a good job. Saul goes to, to uh, defeating all the enemies, man. They love Saul. But if God says that they're not for you, you better watch out. Because just because it goes good for a little while. See, only humans can see what's in front of them. But God's got vision that he can see the end from the beginning. Amen. He says his eyes go to and fro upon the face of the earth, speaking whom he may do good to. He, looking over his children, not just like the enemies running to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. But the eyes of the Lord go to and fro upon the face of the earth, seeking whom he may do good to. God's looking to perform his work. And, and so Saul gets in there and Saul set apart for a certain time. And the next thing you know, he's, he begins to play with his sanctification. 
and, and Saul, Saul comes to a place in his life where God gives him a specific commandment. He says, I want you to go and destroy the Amalekites. For, for Amalek, he mocked the children of God when they came out of Egypt. He said, I want you to go in there and listen to me. How many knows it's important to listen to everything God tells you to do? Yeah, we got some that likes to obey bits and pieces of what God tells you to do. You're at the wrong church, friend. We're full gospel. If we're going to obey God, let's do it right. Let's don't do it 95% or I'm doing better. No, he wants to make you whole. Amen. Amen. He says, I want you to go in there and I want you to destroy everything. Somebody say everything. everything. How many of those that God wants all the sin out of your life? Yes. Well, you're going to be quiet now. Oh, preacher, I still got this. I'm harboring. If you want total victory today, come to Christ. Amen. Christ doesn't set you halfway free. He sets you all the way free. That's what, that's what it gets me when people, they, they come to church and they're drunkards and they're, they're, they're uh, whatever. And, and God has set them free from the big stuff that we call. And then, then it's that mouth that gets them in trouble. Gossip. Backbiting. Wow. And let me go on. Come on. I, I ain't talking to nobody in here, am I? <laughs> it's the little foxes that what? It's going fine. And, and so Saul goes in there and he makes a good trial. And then, he, then God tells him to destroy the Malachites, destroy them all. And Saul goes in there, no, no joke. He goes and he wipes them out. But he saves the king of Amalek, the Amalekites. He saves him. And he saves all the oxen and the, the lambs and all the offering things that they had for offering. He brought them back. And before he could give it to God, God told Samuel to go down there and tell him, I have rejected him from being king. Now this was confident for the children of Israel. They had put their confidence in this man, but they put their confidence in something they wanted. Can I tell you today, we need to quit, quit wanting what God doesn't want for us. We need to find out what God's plans are for us, God's visions are for us. Because if you're going after something that you want, but you ain't talked to the Lord about it, you're going to waste the majority of your life, and you're going to come to a dead-end road. You're going to work, you're going to toil, you're going to fight, you're going to cry, you're going to pray, and the next thing you know, it's going to be a dead-end road. How many of these ever wasted some of their life after their own dreams? I have. Yeah. Wasted their life after their own visions and come to find out it's much easier just to hit your knees and say, Lord, what's your plans for my life? Amen. Where do you want me to go? I'm tired of spinning wheels. You see them old race cars, they all boiling that smoke. They ain't going nowhere, though, are they? What's wrong with some of us when I go anywhere? And so so he rejected, he rejected uh, Saul from being king. Saul came back with his 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 case he was fighting for. And he told Samuel, he said, But I did what the Lord told me to do. And he did. He did bits and pieces. Of what the Lord taught him to do. He, he wasn't strictly in rebellion. He just wasn't fully obeyed. Oh that right there is good. You need to take that one home with you. He wasn't strictly rebelling. He was just not fully obeyed. Did you get that? I didn't just give you a little bit of time to write that note down. Because not fully obeying. Is just as bad. As, as, as just naturally rejecting. Because it's better to obey. Than it is to sacrifice. And so he brings all these riches and he brings all this money like God needs money. That's what's wrong a lot of times. People come to church and feel like they can throw some money in the offering plate and they good with God. God don't need your money. God's got the whole, it's his anyhow. I don't know why the Lord take my 10%. That ain't your 10%. That's the Lord's 10%. And it's sanctified and holy unto the Lord. Ain't that what it said? A tenth is sanctified and holy. A lot of people wonder why they can't prosper. Wonder why they can't be blessed because they're cursed. You can't be blessed when you're cursed. And you can't be cursed when you're blessed. Glory be to God. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. That man took Balaam up there. Balaam was a prophet of the Lord one time. And he, I think it was Baal, I can't remember exactly the name, but they took him up to the hill and he said, curse the children of Israel for them. He said, I don't care what you give me. I'm going up and I'm going to tell you what the Lord has to say. And he came back and said, I, I can't curse it. And so he took him to another place and offered some offerings. Here it is, better to obey. It is sacrifice. Took him some offerings to another place in the hill. He said, come back and tell me some good news. He said, I can't tell you what the Lord told me. He said, I want you to curse the children of Israel. He came back and said, I can't curse them. The Lord told me to bless them. 
Third time he took him up, he began to offer all kinds of stuff. He said, I said, come back with some good news, and I'll pay for it. He said, if you give me the half of the heavens, I can't tell you no more than what the God of heaven told me to tell. Thank God for preachers that won't be bought with a price. They've already been bought by the price of the blood of Jesus, and they ain't come with cheerleaders and pom-poms to make you feel good. They come to tell you what the Lord has to tell them. You can take it or leave it, but if you take it, you'll be better. If you leave it, you'll be worse than what you were to start with. He said, that if an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he seeketh dry places, right? Yeah. And he said when that spirit comes back, which that means our spirit and we're lost, when it comes back, he brings seven more evil spirits yeah. with him. You, you're, you're, you're tempted to fall away sometimes. Don't tell me you're not. You're tempted to backslide sometimes. All of us, every one of us, the preacher, the deacon boy, every one of us, the enemy comes by and tempts our soul sore and tells you once you give up on the Lord, won't you just quit, won't you just take a break. There is no break in the kingdom of heaven. We run the race with patience that is set before us. Come on, we have a cloud of witnesses that already made it. And if they can make it, we can make it by the power of God inside of me. I can't turn back because I can barely live with myself and who I was, and seven times worse, I don't think I can put up with it. I think I'll hold on to the Lord. I'm not where I need to be. I'm not where I should be, but I'm not where I was at. I'm better than who I was. Glory be to God. Sometimes we don't see this progressive sanctification taking place, and so Samuel comes by and he tells, he tells Saul, he says, bad news. God's rejected you as being king because you didn't fully obey. He was set aside to be king. He was set aside just like sanctification to be set aside for the work of the Lord. And I want to tell you today, there's a lot of people that all of us, if we come to Jesus Christ, we're sanctified. We come through Jesus Christ's blood, we are sanctified. And isn't it a tragedy? I want to use this picture to try to give you a little uh, terminology in your mind, what I'm talking about. Some people have, and us country folks are a little different, but uh, some people have this, this uh, uh, I don't know what kind of cabinet it is, maybe a uh, fancy cabinet up in their dining room, carrier or chair, I don't know what they call them, but anyhow, they got these, these fancy glasses up in there. Karaoke, what? Karaoke. <laughs> Karaoke, Karaoke, I don't know. Anyway, that's a fan, I, I got it right, fancy cabinet. And, and it's got glass in where you can see through it, and they let you see these fancy cups. And they ask him, what is that for? That's for a special occasion. <laughs> and didn't I just insult you? You ain't special enough. <laughs> That's when special people come over my house. <laughs> but what a tragedy it is to show that fancy, fancy dishes off. And the day that you finally pull them out of that Cheerio cat. <laughs> It got dust all over. You have to wash it before you can serve it. And to me, that's a tragedy for the Lord. How many knows God wants to brag on his children? I can prove it to you. I can prove it to you. Satan came up to the sons of God in the judgment in the days of Job. And God issued that trial, not Satan. God told Satan, he said, have you considered my servant Job? Perfect man, upright, one who assured evil and fear God. Satan didn't say nothing about Job. God, brag. let me tell you something. You ought to be thankful if you can be mentioned in the breath of God to be bragged on. Amen? You ought to worry about what people have to say about you because most of the time the people that are highly esteemed by people are lowly esteemed with God because God don't judge the same. Everybody that is charisma and, and, and fancy fine for folks and folks praising Jesus said, woe be unto that man when all shall speak well of. You need to make your mind up today. Are you sanctified for men? Are you sanctified by God? Are you set apart for men's service? Do you do what man tells you to do? Or do you do what God tells you to do? We need to take a stand today and say, if the Lord fought for me and he separated himself from me, we ought to separate ourselves for the Lord and say, Pa, if you want me to go, I'll go. If you want me to jump, I'll jump. Ask him how high. Yeah. Give, the, give the instructions to please the Lord. The Bible said in, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, by faith in it was translated that he should not see death was not found. Because he was translated. Before he was translated, he had this saying that he pleased the Lord. That's going to mean it all when we stand before God. 
But friend, what are you waiting on? Don't wait till your funeral day because when the tree falls, it's over. You can't be doing that when you're dead. You preaching your funeral right now. What's the Lord going to say to you on judgment day? Well, he was a jolly good old fellow. No, sir. He's not worried about that. He's not worried about nothing. What he's concerned with is what you do with the blood of Jesus. What you do with my son's atonement that I provided for you. You know, my son walked out the door today. He went to the radio program with me. I don't know how many jackets we bought. He probably had jackets upon jackets upon jackets. First thing you walk outside, it's 40 degrees. <laughs> son, you got jackets in your closet. Plenty of them. All different flavors, different colors. It's just the same way when we walk out into this world without the coat of Jesus Christ. He's took us and give us provision for salvation. And if we go to hell, it's our own fault. Jesus Christ has provided us a clean life. Now it's, us, it's up to us to live that life. A lot of people don't like living close to the Lord. Uh, living close to the Lord will cause you some trials. It'll cause you some confusion because I'm telling you, when you try to live your best for Jesus, I ain't talking about this lukewarm life. You pop up in church once in a blue moon. You're here, but not really. So I, I, let me tell you something. Church attendance is good. We need to attend church. But church attendance only does not tell you what kind of walk you have with the Lord. It doesn't. What you do when you leave the church tells you what kind of walk you have with the Lord. Do you ever talk to him? Do you ever have time alone with him? Do you meditate upon the word of God? Do you eat the word of God and consume the word of God and do the word of God? Not just hear it only. Amen. And when you finally make up your mind, you know, I've had enough. Yeah, I, I'll be so thankful that when Oak Grove Assembly of God gets to the place, that the majority of us gets to the place that says, you know what? I'm tired of the ordinary services. I'm tired of the natural. I want more supernatural in my life. I'm tired of sick folks. I want to see the healing manifestation of God. I'm tired of dry services. I want to see the glory fall. And when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, it will press you to do something about it. Look at somebody today and say, you're going to do something? Did you come to church to do something or did you come to wait on the 12 o'clock dinner bell to ring? Are you looking to go and eat and take your Sunday evening nap or do you want something different for your life? I don't know about y'all, but people are dying and going to hell. And they're dying and going to hell on our clock, on our watch. We're the church. It's time for the church to rise up and be different from the world, to be a city set on a hill, to be a lighthouse, to be salt, to be light, to have something that they can come and receive something from. Crying shame when people have to come to church with sicknesses and go to the doctors for healing. Come on, Great. I'm not against you if you're a doctor or your nurse. Thank God for you. They say when Luke was the physician, he rode with Jesus. Absolutely right. But I never remember, remember scripture where Luke healed somebody. Luke observed what the healer was doing. It's time that we begin to preach Christ and him crucified by his stripes we were healed. It's not if it be his will that we're healed. We were healed. And when you go to claiming that and standing on it, you're going to see something. Yeah. We had a nurse come in here one time. We was taking prayer requests up. She says, pray for the hospital. Said, what about it? Pray for our business to pick up. I said, oh no. <laughs> We're not in that business, huh? I'm thankful you're coming to church, but we ain't praying for sick folk. We pray for sick folk to be whole folk. Amen? Yeah. It's a shame that we preach for an hour and we don't even have people at the altars praying. It's a shame. We'll walk right out of the church with ailments in our body and won't even bring them to the altar. You know what that tells me? We don't believe what the Lord done. Let's just be honest. We don't believe it. Well, I've already asked. Keep asking until something happens. Yeah. Oh, it's quiet. You meddling preacher. You're not preaching no more. I'm telling the truth. Amen. When you don't go back to the Lord, you don't believe him no more. You've done gone so many times and got the same old results over and over and over till you came to that place in your life that you just said, I don't believe it no more. Don't let the enemy come inside of your head and lock you down with doubt. You keep praying until you see the answer fall. Go back and read Luke chapter 18. I love that illustration. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We need to stay into the word of God. 
And when God calls us, listen here, I, I want to I give this. Oh, my son has played baseball for a few years now. My daughter's played softball. And it seems like everywhere you go, we've played all over the place, different leagues, this, that, and other. You're going to find someone that's not a teammate. And if you've played sports long enough, you know what I'm talking about. There'll be somebody on the team that's just, they don't, they're not a teammate. It's all about them. And if the balls hit the third base and they're shortstop, they'll go over there and get in front of the third baseman because it's all about them. And sometimes we run across that position in church sometimes where it's all about them. And if we could get the revelation of what we could do together, we quit with that, that, that arrogant attitude, it's all about me. John the Baptist didn't have that attitude. He said, I must decrease. He must increase. Church comes all about him and knowing who we are. How many remembers our, our, our mission statement? To know who we are in Christ and to serve in that position. If you've been put at shortstop, serve at shortstop. Well, you just don't understand how many times the ball been getting by the third baseman. Hey, if you want to do something, I know what the short shortstop does when the balls hit the third base. They go around behind and back them up. I wish I had somebody help me preach today. Come on. Don't get in front of them and try to take their ball because they're never going to know how to catch it, too. Yeah, we need, to, we need to, the philosophy in our mind that we go down together and we go up together. I love that commercial where those mentally challenged children are running that marathon and they're all looking for the prize. Who would run a race? The Bible even talks about having a prize and obtaining a prize. And they're all looking for the finish line, but along the way, one of their partners fell down. Come on. Oh, the whole race stopped. Then wasn't nobody caring about number one. They were caring about their partners. Amen. They might have all have been racing against one another, but they were all for one another. That's what's called good sportsmanship. I can't stand to watch a game when you got some arrogant attitude of little player that thinks they hit in a bag of skills and they all want everybody to see them. Yeah. If the umpire calls a strike and it's a ball, they're going to have a temper tantrum just like they do at home and throw a hissy fit right on the step. I tell you what they need to do to the parents. Need to come on, I need to get that bell out, take them behind the woodshed and teach them a little bit about attitude and let the game keep going. Come on, because they can play the game without you. Woo! I wish I had somebody help me preach today. You see, some folk come to church feeling like they can't have church if I don't show up. I said, let the church roll on and Jesus is here. He's what the church is all about. Amen. I ain't even got warmed up yet. Praise God. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Praise God. He tells Timothy here, he says, oh, Flee from youthful lusts. <laughs> Boys and girls started early days, and now I'm talking about daddy had a little girl at school I like, and I tell them. <laughs> girls started young age nowadays. Come on. Mm mm mm, ain't he fine? <laughs> Don't you need some help in math? <laughs> you need to be thinking more about algebra than chemistry. Come on. Great, bro. And these boys and girls can't even have school because all this flirting on their mind. That's it. Y'all are... Come on, bro. It used to be love letters back in the day. You know how old school, for your eyes only. Ain't got nothing to do with that. <laughs> you don't even know what color they are. <laughs> Nowadays, they don't write letters. They save paper. They just got Snapchat. <laughs> Blowing some sugar. Hey, I tell you what, though. A lot of folks say, preacher, you better watch out. I've heard about them preacher daughters. The devil is a lie. Come on, come on. I ain't read that scripture. You can quote that mess all you want to. I'm standing on the rock of ages. Yeah. Train them up in the way they should go. Pray every the they don't depart. Guard my house by shotgun. <laughs> did I say that or did I say the sword of the spirit? Which one did I say? <laughs> but I'm glad nowadays to uh, see them blowing kisses. 
at the right folk, a lot of them. Break, bro. Getting a little funny in these days and hours. Break. I didn't have to go there, did I? Bible goes there. Bible said marriage between a man and a woman. Amen. Amen. Not between a boy and a boy. Hear them saying, ugh? Daddy, teach them the right way. Can I get a witness of him? I'll even tell them when they act in sissy. <laughs> Better quit that mess. Oh, that's mean, preacher. That's what the Bible says. I'm a preacher. I got to preach the whole truth. The Bible says in feminine, people won't inherit the kingdom of God. You ain't even know what that word means. You just kept on reading. No matter how give me a translation one day, I don't understand. No, that infeminine word means sissy. You can't even tell what man is no more. Great. I done got Great. myself in a hole there. You can't even tell what a man is no more. I got to quit. You can't even tell what women folks are no more neither sometimes. Come on. If you're a man, act like you're a man. If you're a woman, act like you're a woman. If you're a morphodite, we're going to pray for you. <laughs> Somebody say, move on, preacher. Move on. <laughs> he said, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteous and faith and charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of the pure heart. I want to close today on my closing thought about this. You need to watch who you hang with when you're sanctified. Not who you're friendly for. We don't need to get so stuck up and so you can't touch me holiness that we don't see the law safe. But if you got close ties with lost people, I'm talking about like ties where y'all still go out and do your thing, but you come back into the house and you and, and it's a fine line between this. I want I want to, to, to just stress the value of not getting that can't touch me holy attitude because a lot of church folk get that. They get that syndrome that they're better than everybody. They've gotten saved now. They can't go around lost folk. That's crazy. Yeah. Jesus spent most of his time around harlots and, and drunkards and wine bibbers. And, and I mean, that's who he hung around a lot of times. But when he hung around them, he was persuading them and not letting them persuade him. Right. When he was there, he was the light of that party. Yes. And Bud wasn't the light. Come on, somebody. He was the light. What gets, what gets some folks is they don't know how to balance this, this doctrine of, of possessing, knowing how to possess yourself in your sanctification. I didn't get all my scriptures, but anyhow, you need to know how to possess yourself in your sanctification. Because if you don't watch it, you'll be sanctified one day and you'll be back dirty the next to never get cleaned up again. Yeah. Oh, it got quiet. Oh, yeah. Samson was set aside. He had a Nazarite vow. He had a covenant with the Lord. And as long as he kept that covenant, man, he tied foxes, run foxes down, tied their tails together, burned up the Philistine stocks and, 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 their, and their corn and all their wheat and stuff and, and burned their farm and stuff up. And, and, and not only that, but he would break chains into pieces and snap chains and whoop all types of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And, I mean, he was just bad. He was like he was he was like Superman, just going to phone booth and swap out of that weakness and become the incredible hook, turn green and do all kind of amazing things. But all of a sudden, that old youthful lust got into him, and she started playing with his hair. I, I feel him there. Because if my wife or daughter go to play on my hair, I'm just I just go sweet. I love that attention. Don't you, Miss Don? You know what happened around here? Right? <laughs> 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 it used to, huh? It used to. Praise God. Hey, a while back, <laughs> you can still remember it, okay? You used to have her. Totally good to go. Anyhow, she, she laid in his lap, and he laid, he laid in her lap. Now she laid in his lap. He played in her lap, and she played with his hair, and she called sweet to him. And she says, Samson, where is your great strength at? And he lied to her a couple times. He played with old girl. He said, 
It's in these green whips. If you tie me up with these things and they ain't never gonna die out, sure, I won't have the strength to break. And so they tied him up. Whoosh! And when he said the Philistines on him, he snapped. Second time she comes, she said, Samson, you lied to me. Where's your great strength tied up? Man, I forgot what else it was. He tied him up with something else. And, and they screamed, the Philistines been put. Whoosh! Snapped it going by his business. Are you following what I'm saying? Well, as long as you have your covenant with God, you can do all things. Come on. Greater things you can do because you go to the Father. If you notice that you wake up one morning and you're not able to do what you used to do, it might be because you're not where you used to be. That happens. That happens. And you know why it happens? It happens to Samson because who he was dating or shacking or whatever you want to call it he was doing. He wasn't doing right. He was playing with the wrong woman. And uh, the last time she got to rubbing that hair just right. <laughs> Like an old dog when you hit that belly. <laughs> there you go. Jump. <laughs> hit, hit that spot, boy. <laughs> He's like, he said, all right, I'll tell you now. <laughs> and he said, I ain't never cut my hair from my child. I got a covenant. And she cut his hair, and you know the story. Same situation. Enemy coming against you. They say the same thing. Philistines be against you. Samson. He rose up just like every time before. But this time, he didn't have no power. Church, we got to get back to where we are the power. Amen. The White House, they don't got it. I don't care who they vote in, what they vote in, what type of affiliation they vote in. The church has got to be the answer. I know in the last days there will be a great falling away. I've read that scripture. But have you also read the scripture that Joel prophesied about in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21? It says this, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And I will show signs and wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth and the blood and fire and vapor smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great note of the day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what started that? It started it by God pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. We need to be hungry to be sanctified for the Lord. We need to be hungry to be filled with the Spirit of God. We need to quit playing with the world. He that loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in Him. There's too many church people on Sunday and play with the world Monday through Saturday and think they pop go to Weasel and the Weasel go pop up in this church house and everything's just going to somehow miraculously fall into place. If you ain't done what you need to do through Monday through Saturday, it ain't going to happen on Sunday. We need to start living right, bearing our vessels in holiness without no man shall see the Lord. What's wrong with living right? Nothing. Your flesh will fight you tooth and nail for because your flesh don't want to come under subjection from the spirit. The flesh is enmity against the spirit. But if you'll submit yourself, you'll see a different lifestyle that you never knew of. I've heard so many people tell me that they need to lose some weight. They need to lose some weight. They need to lose some weight. But they want to just wake up tomorrow and it be gone. It didn't just pop up overnight. And it ain't gonna pop away overnight. You got to work at it. And I've heard so many people, I'm talking about other folk, because anyhow, I've heard so many people say that when they got to that place of eating, right, that they enjoyed it. They didn't know that they could do it, but they enjoyed it. And uh, I'm with you, brother, I feel you. <laughs> I ain't got there leaving. <laughs> don't want to go there. But anyhow, I'm just using that for a picture frame because I do want to get close to the Lord. I do. I want to get close to the Lord. But you're not going to get so close overnight. Amen. Backsliders don't backslide overnight. They just bear, gradually get away from the shore. And they get so far away that they feel like the Lord can't bring them back to that place where they need to be at. God is able to bring you back where you need to be at. Don't quit calling on him. Don't keep striving. 
to be like Jesus. That's what he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Timothy, pastor of this church, he says in the first, uh, let's see, second, uh, Timothy 1, 5 through 7, he said, when I called to remember, the only thing faith that's in me was dwelt first in my grandmother Lois and my mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He said he stirred the gift within us, the life on them, by laying on the hands. He said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What's God called you to do? Let me, let me make this statement. I felt like the spirit of God dropped in my spirit before we have our altar call today. If you miss church, and people don't miss you, more likely, you don't have much involvement in the church. I said that boldly. I got to looking in the scriptures when they built the first church in the Old Testament. They had thousands of jobs to do in the church. A lot of times, people don't want nothing to do in the church. If they want something to do in the church, they want to bypass the little stuff and move right on up to the top. That ain't how it works. He that's faithful over a few things will be made ruler over many. You don't bounce from zero to the top overnight. You got to work yourself at it. I've been working with my dad for years now, and I'm not no boss man to do a woman. <laughs> you have all the boss. <coughs> But there may come a day in my life where God leads me to that. But I'm learning and I'm gleaning. And you know what else I'm doing? I'm serving the one that's above me right now because you can't have that bad attitude. How many has ever felt jealousy on your life where people just envied what you've done, envied what you had going on in your life? Don't be, don't never get a jealous spirit because God can place you in a place and call you to a calling that he wants you, if you'll be faithful over what you've already been called to do. Amen? And quit trying to start out on top. Bear your sanctification of where he's got you to work for and obey the Lord. And when you do it, don't do it to please your pastor. Don't do it to please the sinners of God. Don't do it to please your church congregation. Do it to please the Lord and do it with all of your might. Don't do it with laziness. Don't do it with emptiness. I mean, some people, when they do their job and on Monday through Friday, all they care about is the paycheck on Friday. Yeah. That's all they're there for is the paycheck on Friday. God has not called us with that type of spirit. We ought to have an excellent spirit. We ought to be working to show, show our boss men and God and what we are able to do with the new spirit he's placed within us because you never know on your job when one of them lost people are going to be watching you and one of these days you're going to want to invite them to church but because of the gospel you've already been preaching without your mouth, they probably ain't going to come because you're not doing what you're talking about. They should do. If you'll walk to walk and talk to talk, it won't be long they'll say hey I want to go where you go because you got something I ain't got and I'm not jealous of what you got I want what you got and we shouldn't be so high minded to feel like that they can't get what we got because we are who we are by the grace of God and we need to lead all the people we can into this marvelous grace stand to your feet today